Thank you, everybody. My name is Adam Scow. I'm the California Director with Food and Water Watch. Thanks to Miguel and all of you for coming out today. There's a lot of uh, activity, excitement in the air, uh, and a lot of concern about the future with the climate summit happening this week, and there's a lot of things going on, so we're happy that you're here. Um, I'm very excited to introduce the founder uh, of Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action, Winona Howder, who is an activist, author, advocate, uh, founder of Food and Water Watch 13 years ago uh, when Food and Water Watch left Public Citizen. Uh, with 13 staff members, it has now blossomed to over 100 staff members with uh, offices all over the country with a, a specialty and dedication to organizing to make change. A little bit about Winona. Uh, she was inspired by childhood experiences that ingrained in her appreciation for the environment and a passion for justice. When she was 11, her father bought a farm in the Bull Run Mountains of Virginia. There she developed an appreciation for what it really means to grow food, she picked potato bugs, plucked chickens, and chopped kindling. In high school, she organized her female classmates to wear pants in defiance of an outdated dress code and participated in a sit-in over a civil rights issue. After she received her undergraduate degree, she worked on poverty and aging issues in Virginia. At Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action, Winona's leadership helped us call, become the first national organization to call for a ban on fracking when many other organizations were afraid to do so. Thank you. Winona has helped provide strategic guidance for national and international campaigns to halt fracking. Her recent book, Fracopoly, The Battle for the Future of Energy and the Environment, exposes how more than 100 years of political influence peddling facilitated the control of our energy system by a handful of corporations. And she looks at the growing movement to ban fracking and keep fossil fuels in the ground. And her previous book, Foodopoly, The Battle Over Food and Farming in America, examines the corporate consolidation and control over our food system and what it means for farmers and consumers. That book was reviewed by Publishers Weekly and called a meticulously researched tour de force. So I'm very excited to invite Winona Howder to come to the stage. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Adam. And it's such a pleasure to be here today, and it's a special pleasure to be with a room full of people who don't believe that Mother Earth should be run like a business. So as Governor Brown kicks off this self-congratulatory summit, so-called climate summit, it is really long past time to have a conversation, an honest conversation, about the existential crisis that we face. Climate chaos is accelerating before our very eyes. The fires, the floods, the hurricanes, and drought are having a devastating impact on people. And poor people and people of color are being hit the hardest. I mean, just look at what's happened with Puerto Rico. Recent studies put the death toll now in line with the 9-11 attacks from one storm, 3,000 people. And remember, following 9-11, politicians found the financial resources to engage in two misguided wars to create the Department of Homeland Security, to quickly transform airport security. Yet, the impact of climate change is already many times worse than that of 9-11, and we haven't even begun to feel the, the very worst impacts. Yet the silence from our politicians, both Republican and Democratic, is deafening. But we can't let this unprecedented crisis leave us depressed or frozen with fear. We can still stop the worst of climate change if we take the urgent and visionary action. It's time to stop talking about 2045 or 2050 and make the dramatic changes we need now. We have the technology. We have to create the political will. Scientists are telling us if we don't move off of fossil fuels, we will soon cross 
a point of no return. And after that, it's going to be almost impossible to keep the Earth's temperature from going above two degrees Celsius. Remember, that was the goal of the Paris Agreement, to cut emissions enough to keep the planet from crossing a limit that could have a catastrophic effect. The fires, the deadly storms, the sweltering heat, the mudslides, the drought, and the floods are just the beginning. A recently released study by atmospheric scientists at Oxford and Utrecht University is just the latest research showing that we have only a few years left for policymakers to take action. Based on their model, scientists say that the point of no return is the year 2035 unless we cut emissions and make significant progress towards going 100% renewable. And the higher the Earth's temperature goes, the harder it's going to be to predict the climate consequences. That's because, we all know this, certain natural systems on the planet could be activated by warming and consequently trigger further warming, like a row of cascading dominoes. Potential tipping points include the thaw of permafrost, which would release trapped gases, and the death of the Amazon rainforest, which is, of course, one of the ways that atmospheric carbon dioxide gets reduced. If this were to happen, we could experience what scientists call hot house Earth. In that situation, Earth's average temperature could raise four or five degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and lead to sea levels up to 200 feet higher than they are now. Parts of the Earth could become actually uninhabitable. And we're already in a dangerous situation where current food production could be impacted. Lloyd's of London, hardly a progressive company, it's the giant insurance broker, issued a report called Food System Shock, which says that the greatest threat to civilization over the next 40 years is likely to be extreme drought and floods hitting multiple major global grain producing bread baskets simultaneously. Their report outlined a plausible famine situation that causes rioting, civil war, mass starvation, and severe losses to the global economy. The scenario that Lloyd's lays out works out to about an 18% chance over the next 40 years of having this happen. That's why the work that all of you do on soil and promoting regional agriculture and living with nature as if we're part of nature is so important. Now with this dire situation and all of the climate change related tragedies that California has experienced, you would think that Governor Brown would be doing all that he could to move the state off of fossil fuels. You would think that the global climate summit he's hosting this week would be all about developing a plan to immediately and transition the, the state and the country to 100% renewable, clean energy. But unfortunately, Brown is part of the problem, the not the solution. The state of While of California fuels, is viewed nationally and globally as an environmental this leader, would be this image is undeserved. California is still the third largest oil producing state in the country. California is the biggest dairy state in the union with more than 1.8 million cows that are contributing significantly to climate change. Toxic oil wastewater is being used to irrigate crops. Big oil and big ag play an outsized role in the state's politics, and they block the state-level action that would address these problems. Governor Brown has his 
have stood up to the best of interests. He talks a good game, warning about climate change, but he refuses to embrace the policies required to really address this crisis. He cuts deals with industry behind closed doors. He endorses weak regulations that allow oil and gas companies to drill and frack unabated and pump dangerous levels of pollution into California's air and water. Under Governor Brown's watch, fracking and extreme oil and gas extraction have expanded across the state. He's been vocal in opposing Trump's offshore drilling plans, but behind the scenes, Brown is quietly rolling out the, the red carpet to oil and gas interests in California, California authorizing hundreds of offshore wells that threaten California's iconic shoreline. In fact, he fired two top regulators after oil and gas interests complained that they weren't getting their drilling permits approved quickly enough. Governor Brown's approach to greenhouse gas pollution in California is pro-industry, not pro-climate or pro-people. Studies show that at the state's carbon cap-and-trade program, which, which lets industry pay to pollute, hasn't reduced emissions, and it's actually worsened pollution problems in many communities. Not only that, the updated cap and trade plan prevents local regulators from enacting the policies that would actually reduce emissions. It gives tax cuts to corporations, it funnels money to factory farms, and it allows polluters to avoid emission reduction through these ridiculous criminal offset technicalities. Governor Brown refuses to shut down the disaster plague Aliso Canyon gas field in Los Angeles. Every day, families in the San Fernando Valley experience horrible problems with their health, including bleeding, rashes, nausea, and headaches from Aliso Canyon's toxic leaks. A health survey found cancer-causing chemicals such as uranium and benzene in children's hair and urine samples. Meanwhile, Brown's sister has made millions as a board member of SEMPRA, which owns the field. That's real corruption. Besides being a threat to the climate, drilling across the Central Valley is contaminating drinking water supplies. Under the Brown administration, California authorized the injection of toxic drilling wastewater directly into water aquifers. While this is devastating to the people whose drinking water is poisoned, there are also many implications for food production in the Central Valley. That food is sent around the country and around the world. And crops are being sprayed with this toxic wastewater too, and also being shipped all around the country. And some of them are considered organic. And unbelievably, Governor Brown strongly advocated giving the Trump administration, yes, giving the Trump administration new power over California's energy future. Brown aggressively pushed legislation, AB 813 for you from California, that would, this legislation would have eliminated California's hard-won authority over its own power grid, and it would have been replaced with a multi-state western regional operator. This is not abstract, but it's really important because it would have been a big step towards Enron 2.0, that crisis um, a decade and a couple of decades ago. It would have legally empowered Trump's Federal Energy Regulatory Commission
Commission to be in charge of whether California's utilities use fossil fuels or clean, renewable energy. Blinded by his faith in markets, Brown teamed up with billionaires and the economic interests who work and I, who orchestrated the Enron energy crisis to push this foolish bill in the legislature. But in a major victory that proves that we can build political power, our movement stopped this terrible scheme from moving forward just a little over a week ago. A major I'm sure many of you know about. It was passed in the legislature, and Brown will probably sign it, although he's been holding it hostages to the, the bill that I just mentioned. That legislation is a step forward, but it really comes nowhere close to addressing the crisis. It moves California to 60% renewable energy by 2030, uh, a modest increase over uh, the current goal. This is good, but California can be a leader. California should be a leader. So we need to come back and follow up on this legislation, clean up the renewable portfolio standard, and push California to 100% renewable energy. Let California be the leader we need nationally and internationally. And with only a few months left in office, this really is Governor Brown's last chance to change course and redeem himself. But it's not looking real good. Even though Brown's last chance campaign was endorsed by 800 organizations and is demanding that Brown curtail the fossil fuel industry by stopping all new projects in California. We are going to meet him in the streets of California this week and force the next governor, Governor Newsom, to take the action that we need. These actions this week are very important, but they need to be part of an ongoing campaign. They should be a lesson for Gavin Newsom, who is going to be the next governor, and it's time to stop giving Democrats a pass just because the alternative is worse. This really, this week, needs to be the beginning of a renewed effort to make California this national leader. Our collective survival is dependent on building the political power to achieve bold and ambitious goals. California must stop all new oil wells. California must stop fracking, stop building gas-fired power plants and letting gas storage facilities run and build pipelines. We must shut down all existing fossil fuel infrastructure. We must pass measures that build out our renewable energy capacity at the local and the state level. And while we're advancing state-based policies, we also need to move California's congressional delegation to lead at the national level. The All Fossil Fuels for a Better Future Act, H.R. 3671, was authored by Tulsi Gabbard, and if passed, it would move the country to 100% renewable energy by 2035, with 80% build out by 2027. It was drafted with input from the environmental justice community to ensure that the interests and concerns are up front and center of these communities. The bill now has 44 sponsors, including Barbara Lee, Zoe Lofgren, 
and Mark de C. Saliner in the Bay Area. However, just 10 of California's 53 members of Congress are on the bill. This means that Nancy Pelosi, Ro Khanna, Mike Thompson, Jared Huffman, and others have not taken up the mantle of leadership that we need. We must pressure every member of the delegation to sponsor and advocate for this landmark legislation. And if you'd like to help with this, take out your phone now and text renewables to 69866. That's renewables to, eight nine, to 69866. Obviously, achieving all of this is going to require changing the political landscape in the state. And that's no small task of the state with the fifth largest economy in the world. Stopping the worst of climate change and rebuilding our democracy will require continuing to organize an army of grassroots allies and volunteers in every corner of the state. It's going to require electing unbought and uncompromised champions to the state legislature and Congress, and eventually the presidency. But winning is possible, and it is the only choice that we have. When the OFF Act was introduced last year, it had only four co-sponsors. Now it has 44, and that took a lot of organizing. And it also has 30 congressional candidates, including several in top-tier races that made it through their primaries and pledged to support the bill if elected in November, many including Ale Alexandria Acacia Cortez and Ayanna Presley campaigned actively on moving to 100% renewable energy by 2035. If we can get this bill reintroduced next year and starting with over 50 sponsors, that gets us closer to where we need to be. We are also witnessing enormous change at the state level. In Maryland, Food and Water Action is proud to support Ben Jealous, who has pledged the, to move the state to 100% renewable energy by 2035. In Florida, Andrew Gillum is polling ahead of the Trump crony Ron DeSantis, and it's, is running on a pledge to stop offshore drilling and to ban fracking. In Colorado, communities have come together to put a measure on the ballot that would create a 2,500 foot setback to oil wells. This would pretty much close the industry down. And this is in a state that's been dominated by the fossil fuel industry. In Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer has vowed to shut down Dirty Line 5 pipeline if, elect, if elected governor. And there are more, many, many more. At Food and Water Action, we're thrilled to support candidates here in California, like Robert Rivas from Monterey County and Giovanna Beckles from the East Bay. Both are running for state assembly and have records fighting the oil industry in their communities. Sacramento will look a lot different in January with these two warriors in the State House. We can do this if we do not let fear of failure prevent us from fighting for what we need. We can do this if we do not settle for half measures and stay true to our demands. We can do this. If we are bold and relentless, we can force our elected leaders to follow us 
not the other way around. We can do this. Together, we can revitalize our democracy and we can stop the worst of climate change. We've seen what it's possible in our collective struggles for justice around the country, from New York to Boston, Florida to Nebraska, and here in California. We've seen communities organize, go door to door, make phone calls, hold rallies, and force elected officials to champion bold solutions or to lose to someone who will. Friends, our climate, our democracy is at a tipping point. This is not a time to stay on the sidelines or to play politics. We have no other choice. Let's join together to save our communities and the planet we live on. We can't take half measures. We need to fight hard. We need to fight with urgency. We need to fight like we live here because this is the only planet we've got. We can do this. We must do this. We have no other choice. Onward together. If you have some questions for Winona, you know, for a while I was wondering why they didn't have speakers at the march. It's the first march I have seen in my life without speakers, without a rally. And I was thinking, I was part of the organization in, in the beginning, and you know, they were asking us for suggestions about the march, and we sent several suggestions, and they told us, you know, we have to talk with the steering committee, and, the, and it's great, we need your, your suggestions because you are local and you know everything that's going on here in San Francisco. And at the very end, they send the response and they say, thank you for your suggestions, but we have decided something totally different. One of the things that I have recommend is to have speakers at the rally that were going to question Jerry Brown, you know? And I wonder why they didn't. So I told them at the end, I was joking, I say, you know, I think that this is a democrat organized march, not a democratically organized march. So it's the way I saw it. I'm sorry, I am very cynical. It's why I'm here with Winona, because I think we have something in common. <laughs> and this is in live stream. Please share it, because they didn't see her, her speech in, at the rally yesterday. It's great that we, thousands of people came out yesterday, and I, I would like them to, to see this kind of speeches. We have to question everything. It's what my grandfather told me since I was a little kid. He was an anarchist. It's why I'm an activist. And we're going to have maybe five questions to, for Winona. Please, questions, no, no long presentations. If you have some concrete questions, please go to the microphone and five people in, because she has to take a flight soon. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Jeff. Uh, thank you very much for that rousing speech. I really appreciate it. Uh, I have something incendiary to ask you about half measures and the, and the way to move forward as far as the species is concerned. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the history of this nation and what it took to get people over here to start this nation in the first place. They were oppressed. Um, there's something serious that's going on here, and I wonder... Uh, why starting another nation is not a viable solution at this point. Um, after all this time and after all this history of broken treaties and, and broken promises and profits over people, why is not a collective mindset and a, a, a new nation a, a viable solution and a way to move forward? Well, you know, I think we're trying to work today to do what we can do to save the planet. There are a lot of long-term problems that have been around for a while, and a lot of social justice problems that must be solved, the stratification, uh, the abuse uh, of people of color. I mean, a long list of, of problems, but the first thing we must do is 
stop the worst of climate change. And the fastest way to do that is at our state level and to hold our elected leaders accountable for, so that we can pass legislation, deal with some of these uh, terrible regulations immediately. Regarding cap and trade, um, has that done any, any good in California? And what should be done to improve it? No, cap and trade has really set the state backwards. And in fact, uh, this year, um, when the measure was uh, passed again, there, it actually took the ability of uh, local governments to mandate um, emissions reductions. And I'd actually have Adam answer that question maybe at the end, because I'm in our national office and he knows the details of that. We are not fans of these market mechanisms um, that really are all about continuing to let Wall Street make money from uh, our precious resources. We need to turn away from that and actually um, pass the mandates we need to get off of fossil fuels and have a clean renewable energy portfolio standard. Yes. Enron 1.0 was promoted by Kavanaugh of Natural Resources Defense Council. The um, SB 813 was promoted by Kavanaugh of the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. Big Green sometimes gets into empire building rather than um, their original uh, mission of protecting the earth. Whether we call out NRDC for promoting this grid regionalization. Well, you know, we worked this um, bill in the legislature and went toe to toe with NRDC and uh, were very honest, wrote op-eds, uh, met with numerous uh, members of uh, the California legislature. So, you know, I think we've been pretty upfront um, in working against this legislation and helping along with Consumer Watchdog put together a state coalition uh, to stop this terrible measure. And we're going to need to be vigilant uh, in the next uh, California legislature to make sure this doesn't come back. And after I take a couple more questions, I'm going to ask Adam to come up because he can talk um, with a lot more detail about how this happened. Yes. Hi. Um, since the 70s, the know-how reduced the, or to make it more efficient, uh, our use of energy is there. We don't implement it. There's also some really amazing solar solutions that aren't photovoltaic. Again, that communities can operate. They don't have to be these uh, very expensive solar systems that are being for transmission lines. So when you talk about renewables and getting us off mm -hmm. carbon, how are we gonna, I mean, you know, oil and stuff, how are we going to do that without, if we don't really localize it? Yeah, you know, I worked on renewable energy in the mid-80s. Um, we knew that renewable energy was ready then. We have the technology to do it, and we've had the technology to do it. It's really about the political will to make sure that we have the policies in place so that we can do it. And while we talk a lot about renewables, of course, energy efficiency is the, um, the first line uh, of defense. We can use our energy much more efficiently. We need to have uh, triple pane windows in every building in the United States. Think about the jobs potential. We need to use the resources of this nation to really mobilize to, uh, to do our best to stop climate change. And we could be creating jobs. We could be doing this. What's holding us back 
are people like Governor Brown and many, many people who've been elected um, to Congress. And many of them are Democrats. We can't let Democrats continue to uh, um, take this soft line about where we need to go. 2050 is way too late. We have to do this starting tomorrow. OK, I'll take one more question. Actually, I want to ask your opinion. Um, Kari Hammerschlag, who you know, who works very, very hard on the farm bill, has rented a house down in um, Tulare area so that those of us who go down there can stump for Cox and um, Jans. So my thought is that if anyone in this room, you know, has a particular uh, prospective congressperson, uh, assembly person, um, senator, <laughs> that they really think should be in Washington to carry our voices forward, rent a house in the area, walk the, walk the districts, help. Yeah. Great. Hear, hear. Adam, do you want to come up and give a little bit more detail to those questions? Sure, absolutely. On the uh, regionalization bill, that bill is dead for the year. Uh, that's great news. It could come back next year. Um, we had a great coalition with labor and environmental and all the groups that push community choice uh, energy, which is growing in California, were crucial to that victory. So um, kudos to those of you who participated in that victory. And let's uh, keep up this coalition and to put the pressure on cleaning up our renewable portfolio standard here in California where we see a lot of pressure from the gas industry to keep us hooked on dirty gas. Uh, they want these mega dairies in the Central Valley, they want to hook us up to that here in the cities. They want us to subsidize it and pay for it. We need to stop that and get to the real renewable solutions that the gentleman was talking about before. I think that was it. Miguel. Thank you so much, Winona. Thank you, Adam.